You know, the, the thing that both Mary Ann and, and, and Shirley said that struck me as so deeply important about history, and it can happen via other disciplines too, but I think it is one of history's gifts, and it's, it's uh, perhaps the most discomforting part about, about doing history, and that is what, what uh, uh, Mary Ann said, the journey to the underworld, this ruthless examination of what transpired in the past, and especially human propensity to evil, and, and the, the, the searching self-examination, what would I have done? Um, and, uh, but I also like what Mary Ann said, I think this is, can be, uh, in these days especially, a uniquely Christian contribution, that is the finding of hope as well. I was going to say they really do go together because uh, once you plumb the depths of, of an honest, and again, I stress honest because it, as close as we can get, uh, I'll say honest even rather than truthful because, because uh, you're trying to get to, again, as ruthlessly honest a sense of the depths of the human condition of you ha that you have. Well, see, then, and really most deeply then, you... Uh, understand the point of God's redemptive activity in the world. And so that honesty about the evil in the past is in fact directly linked to the possibility of some sort of hope for the future. And so, so I mean, that would be another, um, in fact, there's a great collection of, it's in a CD Wedgwood, History and Hope, I think it is. But um, so honesty and hope would be a fun thing to work with there. <laughs> other questions? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Let's yeah. see. <laughs> Acquiescing to an evil world and just trying to separate it from it. So the, the grandiose nature of their project, rightly conceived or not, to both reform the church and Christianize the nation was a daunting one, but it, it also inspired in me then the, the nature of, of uh, not setting our goals too small for the task of being Christian witnesses in this world. Uh, again, I'm not sure that, that the framing of the issue was always done rightly by them, but it, it reminded me that, that um, my aspirations of seeing the kingdom realized were often far too minuscule compared to theirs. Yeah, so would, you, would you permit me to, to slightly um, answer a slightly different question, I mean, which is the question I thought you were going to ask, which, which and, and it's a great question that you asked, but I thought you were going to ask a more pedagogical question because, because um, the, you're, you're absolutely right that, that the, the world that we're inviting students into and I think that's part of the challenge of doing World Civ. We, we often would have first year students in World Civ and it's absolutely understandable why it would seem as if, what does this have to do with anything? Um, as I think about my own journey in a pedagogical way, and I'd like to respond to it that way, although I, I, I can think of something else in the other way as well, but I, I'd like to respond pedagogically. Um, I may have had more tolerance for uh, boredom and expecting learning to be hard than most people. I, I just thought going to college was going to be a pretty hard and dull thing, you know. And so I, so I may have had more tolerance for that process of learning than, than 
students that are coming into college today where, where it's such a fast-paced world. There's no time to slow down. But this is where, this is where I think the um, pedagogical context of the liberal arts college becomes so important because if I think about in my own journey what gave me the courage to persist in the face of studying hard things that I didn't understand why I was studying them, I didn't understand the point of them at the time. It was because I, I really saw um, in the mentors that I ran into in the classroom, in the faculty, uh, and not just in history classes, but in other classes, people whose depth of understanding, whose um, appreciation of the complexity and nuance of the world, people who weren't out for simplistic answers, I knew I wanted to be like those people. And not in a copycat kind of way, but I wanted to live a life that was as willing to meet, again, complexity, ambiguity, and, and the largeness of the world that I saw in them that I didn't have when I started college. So I, I, um, I guess I would respond to your question not so much out of a, um, a particular topic, but more to talk about the importance of that mentoring context that I, that I think is so critical to the liberal arts context. That it, it, because learning is an act of faith. When, to come to college, who knows what they're coming to college for when they come. It's one of the strange, um, uh, I don't like to think of learning as a commodity, but when you think about it, most people coming to college do not know what they're paying for when they're paying for college education. And so learning is an act of faith, and part of our job, I think, as faculty is to give people hope in that sense, that there's a reason to, to, to endure all of these things, which at the time may seem like going into the netherworld. So that's a, a plug for mentoring, I guess I would say, in that pedagogical context that places like Westmont really are trying to put forward. Let me, let me say a word about this. I think, just briefly, I think I took Dante's in help because it's so much more appealing than purgatory. But I, one of the things that I would actually agree to more is that a historian is always more in purgatory than in hell because he doesn't really know how the story ends. That is to say, he, he or she doesn't know where the people he or she studies are going to go. And I think that's one of the wonders of doing history, and so that may be one sign of hope, and maybe it's a way to address your question. A very concrete example of how you move from despair to hope, which, you know, I move from despair to hope every spring when I study the Crusades. I'm hoping my students do too, but at least I do, which is, which is one thing. Which that is, when you study ideologies of jihad and ideology of holy war in the Middle Ages, it can be a despairing task. And yet, if you do that, and I will use Shirley's expression to remember well, what becomes very apparent is that these ideologies have changed through time to respond to very peculiar circumstances. In other words, there is no such thing as the ideology in a Muslim community or the ideology in a, in a Christian community. It is a matter of thinking it through and thinking how it's related to context. And that, to me, is hopeful because we can take that and learn from it, and there's nothing intrinsically true about jihad outside of the context in which it comes. Does that, does that make sense? So in itself, it's a, sign, it's a sign of hope. Understanding the complexity in that case is, is, is a sign that you can engage in discussions about this. That's an example. Any other questions? Yes, Alistair. <laughs> 